Hello everyone and thank you for being with us today. We are really happy to host this new Building Bridges webinar that will explore how sustainable finance can help us create a more resilient financial system. Before diving into the discussion, I would like to remind everybody that the next edition of Building Bridges will take place on the first week of October in Geneva and explore some of the latest trends in sustainable finance, but also highlight the initiatives, projects, and frameworks that will shape the sustainable finance agenda. Uh, so don't hesitate to check out our website, but also down download our BB Connect app if you want to learn more about the program and also meet other members of the community. And I will now give the floor to Peter Vanham, who will lead the discussion today. So Peter Vanham is a journalist and author focusing on the global economy, and he is also executive editor at Fortune. Over to you, Peter. Well, thank you so much, Nora, and welcome everyone to this uh, seminar. As you know, we're going to be discussing a very important question. How can sustainable finance create a more resilient financial system? What we've done today is we've gathered four experts uh, from various sectors who will be talking about this question. And we will be diving into this question by separating it into three smaller sub-questions. I'll get to that in a minute. But first, I want to present you to the panelists of the day. Start with Yevgenia Molotova. Yevgenia is a senior portfolio manager at Picte Asset Management. I suppose that's you know, the bank based here in Geneva. Evgenia, welcome to you. Then we have also from a Geneva-based institution, François-Xavier Vousekovic. I hope I said that correctly, uh, Jean-François-Xavier. We, we, we practiced in advance, but uh, your, your, your smile tells me I got it quite, quite okay, but not quite, quite perfectly. Um, François-Xavier is Chief Investment Officer at Edmond de Rothschild Private Equity. And then we have Andrea Webster, Andrea Webster Finance System Lead at the World Benchmarking Alliance based in London. Welcome to you, Andrea. And Fiona Stewart, who is the Lead Financial Sector Specialist at the World Bank in Washington, DC. An esteemed panel, as you can see, and we'll now dive right into it. Two more things from my side. One, this panel is on the record. And two, if you have any questions or comments or suggestions, you can leave them in the chat or even better in the Q&A. You can access that by going to the top right of this web browser, clicking on the text balloon and then going into the Q&A box. All right, and with that, we'll get to the debate. What's the context? Well, the context is that we've seen in the past months, and I would argue even in the past years, that the financial system can easily be shaking and that investors and shareholders' trust can quickly be lost. On the other hand, we also know or believe that sustainable finance has a key role to play in delivering on environmental, social, and governance objectives, or ESG. It does it by channeling private investment into transition to climate neutral and a resource efficient and fair economy as a complement to public money. We'll talk about that. But what if, what if, that's the question of today, what if applying sustainable finance principles across the industry could not only contribute to a faster transition to the globe, of the global economy, which is what we want, but also to a more resilient financial system? Okay, that's the question. And now I want to turn to Fiona. Fiona, you work at the World Bank, so you are perfectly placed to tell us about the basics of sustainable finance, because I think we often talk about sustainable finance, but we don't always talk about the same thing. So let me ask you a very, very basic question to kick this off. What is sustainable finance? Not, not basic at all. There's a lot of mixing up of terms going on globally. Absolutely. So um, if you take, let's take the EU definition, which is um, sustainable finance is the process of taking environmental, social governance considerations into account when you're making investment decisions. And that should lead to long term investments in sustainable activities and projects. And if you unpick that, when we say sustainable, think of the, the sustainable development goals. And they basically baked out. You, you can boil them down to two 
two goals really one is to to have um growth and activity because there's 17 i suppose in, there's in 17 all. but if you take but, it but down two big buckets two big buckets are the environmental sustainability so working within the planetary boundaries of our environment and then without um excessive uh, inequality those are the two really boils down to in the sustainable It's development goals green an inclusive economy and then underneath the sustainable finance i like the the adage we use a lot about greening finance and financing green and i think that's also a nice sort of way of breaking down okay so there's the you, idea you, you of... got to you got to let us pause there for a second because i think that's you use the expression all the time but i haven't heard that before you said greening finance and financing green yeah so Please. one is the risk so taking looking at the risk of these factors and stopping doing harm stopping financing things that are not meeting those goals and then the financing green is actually driving capital towards projects companies countries that actually do contribute to mm. the sdgs and the paris mm. accords so a sort of prevent negative versus do positive approach exactly yeah tell us about um those two parts if you will to sustainable finance if you look at you know the eu definition of sustainable finance then how big dollar terms is the sustainable finance you know market if you will globally so there's a lot happening on the on the um uh, greening finance on the risk side there's a lot happening there um we have this network for greening the financial system the central banks really stepping up doing stress testing and there's something like estimated mm. if you take about roughly 100 trillion the oecd numbers of of global assets pensions insurance collective investment schemes the estimates are that more than half of that at least half of that is is incorporating the esg factors in some way negative screenings positive screenings but starting to look at the risks mm. and a lot happening we are now building climate risks into our own financial sector assessment programs that we right. do with the imf um the uh we're seeing a lot going on in the reporting side just last week we had the international sustainability standards coming right. out last week a lot happening on the risk side but but the bottom line here is that of all the assets that are managed in the world you said 100 trillion you know give or take a few trillion i suppose that more than 50% are currently already using some sort of an esg filter in that way you could say that they contribute i suppose to that first part of the equation name namely greening finance is that correct yeah i think the risk side the 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 awareness of the issues right. has come up massively now that's can... not of course doing anything positive so let's talk about that if you really look at sustainable finance as you know more precisely being about really doing something positive for you know these ESG considerations uh these ESG goals whether they be the SDGs sustainable development goals or others such as the Paris uh, climate accord how big is that so that's where we're seeing a gap so again there's lots of very many different numbers out there the OECD like to talk about since the pandemic the gap that what we need to finance the SDGs and the Paris accords um to get there by 20 30 is at least something like over 4 trillion a year 4.2 trillion a year. Mm. We're spending something like one ish one and a half. So we're like as like a 2 trillion a year gap. I mean there's other numbers out there they can be bigger smaller but it's a big number and it's a big gap. Okay. So, so that's uh, that's the the more precise, you know, sort of like doing positive on the on the on the specific goals of the SDGs and the Paris Accords. You have a you have 1 to 1.5 trillion invested per year in those you know towards those objectives and you should see to achieve them I suppose to meet them at least by 2030 the, the goals uh, uh you should see 4 trillion a year. Now tell me about sort of you know how these two numbers that you've talked to us about the 50% 50 trillion Uh, of in, in assets globally having some sort of an ESG filter how does that relate to the 1 to 1.5 trillion and the 4 trillion that we need in terms of the truly positive uh, um sort of uh, sustainable finance investments so where we're seeing a lot of progress is on what we call the mitigation side so a lot of the 
particularly the climate finance, is going to um, it's going to uh, solar and wind. It's going to renewables and transport, but it's mostly in OECD countries, China. It's not going to the emerging markets that really need the money to meet the SDGs and to meet the Paris Accords. Mm. And it's not going to adaptation, mm. whether it's for a, um, a forestry, a, a adaptation of agriculture, etc. Right. So, so there's mitigation in meaning, there, but there's you know, still big gaps in there. there. There's maybe a lot of money invested in, you know, clean energy. That would be mitigation in terms of Paris Accord goals, SDGs, the, the green part of it. You see a lot of money invested there. That's maybe the one in 1.5 trillion. Adaptation, especially in... Um, I suppose uh, the global south, or or at least the companies developing countries, there you see probably a big part of that gap. Now, Absolutely. one more question for you. Again, that that screening, that that fifty percent, that fifty trillion dollars um, of the assets that have some sort of an ESG screening. What does it mean in practice that they have this? What's the consequence of consequence of ha of them having this kind of screening, if it isn't to contribute towards, you know, a uh, 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 the SDGs or the Paris Accord, what what then do they do? What do they accomplish? So it's what you're seeing is you're seeing um, the sort of decarbonization. You're seeing quite a lot of moves within the financial sector. So moving financing from fossil fuels to renewables, etc. It's not necessarily feeding through into the real economy yet. It's sort of stopping at the financial sector. And so the money is therefore coming from um, uh, not public markets, from other sources. So the financial sector and portfolios are de-risking for carbon, but it's not really having this impact through into the real economy yet. We can't do mm -hmm. it alone. The financial sector cannot fix, the market can't fix a market failure on its own. Let's be clear. There's a lot we can do. We can act as important right. catalysts so for I change in the real that, economy, but, but we need the policies um, and we need, yeah. um, et cetera, around. We can't do yes. the loan. And we're going to talk about those policies. But but just so, I, so, we, so people get this straight. Like, for example, you invest in the tech sector, right? The tech, you know, say Apple or, you know, Meta or, 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 or uh, um, Alphabet. It could very well be that that investment has gone through an ESG screening, right? You know, because these companies probably don't have a big CO2 footprint, you know, have set certain goals, including also in their supply chains to make sure that there's no child labor, et cetera. So they get through the ESG screening. Therefore, they could fit under those 50 percent of global assets uh, that have gone through an ESG screening. But of course, they don't contribute to achieving this SDGs or climate change. Is that is that a fair way of putting it? Is that? Indirectly, but not directly the capital we need to meet the adaptation goals, for example, right. in the EMG, But So that explains why markets. you would have, you know, one, one, five trillion versus 50 trillion and, and, and how they relate to each other. This has been super useful. Now over to, you know, you talked about the private sector. We've got the private sector here. In fact, we've got two people representing the private sector, if you will. First, perhaps to Francois Xavier. Francois Xavier. You work with private equity. You actually invest in companies. Tell us what sustainable finance looks like at your company, at EDR. And also what size we're, we're talking about, both in absolute terms and then in relative terms, in terms of like everything that EDR does, what is the aspect uh, or what's the uh, uh, share of sustainable finance? Yeah, thank you, Peter. Very happy to, to be with you today. Uh, maybe just to react to what has been said uh, just before, I think we need to differentiate actually what we call ESG integration. This is, you know, the big bulk you, you mentioned, Peter, and you know the intentionality, which is the right. 1.5 billion you mentioned. Okay, so for you, the 50% that we were talking about earlier, you would you would summarize it under the banner ESG integration, right? Yeah, it's, it's a way to, you know, a check the box approach. And, right. and we have to clearly differentiate that approach to intentionality. From intentionality, impact yes. investing, for example, etc. Exactly. And, you know, as, you, as, you, as we all know, we face big challenges uh, today. Uh, climate change, uh, natural resource uh, scarcities, uh, demographic pressure. And I think that, you know, as investors, we, we must change actually our mindset to 
put finance at the service of the industry, society, and the planet, you know, right. with this principle of, of internationality, in, intentionality, to bring concrete solutions right. uh, to these issues. And, so and, you focus on the second aspect that we were talking about. You're, you're going to try to increase that 1 to 1.5 trillion being invested in real solutions. Yeah, absolutely. And to do so, you know, private equity is, is really the right tool to drive change. Why? Because, you know, it has a long-term horizon that protects us, actually, you know, from short-term trends. Right. And uh, a direct also, impact. Exactly. Uh, it has also a transformational approach. Very hands-on, expert teams working together, you know, with the, with the project owners, with the management team within portfolio mm -hmm. companies. Mm -hmm. And finally, it has also an increased, it provides an increased access uh, to, uh, to capital from institutional and individual uh, investors. So, right. combining so a, a lot of positive aspects to, to using private equity as a lever. Now, tell us the numbers. You know, how big is private equity overall at EDR, and how big is the specific aspect? of uh, sustainable, let's say, private Yeah, income. sure. So we, we have been developing you know, this approach for 20 years now at the Watcher Private Equity. So uh, uh, we started at a time where we, we were not talking about uh, impact as such. Mm. Uh, as of today, uh, we, we have 4 billion euros uh, in terms of asset under management across 15 different investment strategies, which all contribute to climate change resilience. Uh, for instance, we invest in green energy generation projects mm. in Europe, uh, in social resilience by supporting economic development in Africa and providing solutions to demographic pressure, economic resilience by supporting the growth of small to mid-sized companies in Europe. Right. So all our strategies, the four billion I mentioned, integrate sustainability in their goal with internationality and with So all of EDR... Purpose. All of the private equity at EDR is directed towards social or environmental impact. Yeah, the bulk of, of it, you know, uh, what we call, if you, if you look at the SFDR regulation, uh, Article 9 uh, strategies, so combining high sustainability objectives with part of the performance uh, fee actually uh, uh, calculated based upon uh, uh, impact criteria. So Mm. tell you how far we go into that direction and and all those strategies are more article 8 but still with a, you know an impact driven uh, strategy okay so i don't know what article 8 and article 9 are i'm going to be honest about that um, but but let's not get lost in the, in those technical technicalities i remember 4 billion of private equity uh, investments at EDR have some sort uh, of uh, uh, social or environmental impact uh, targets uh, uh, tied to it. Thank you. We're going to get back to that um, because we want to know, of course, what that then achieves, but that's for later. First, Yevgenia, you work in another way on, let's say, sustainable finance, and you work on public equity. Tell us about that idea of public equity. But I, I suppose basically you're, 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 you buy shares in existing companies, you buy them on the market. Um, so not private equity, where you buy a, a, a large share of one company and then set the strategy there, long-term strategy, as uh, Francois Xavier said. Uh, but basically, you buy shares of company on the market, uh, and and tell us about you know that strategy, how you know how big that that impact is, uh, uh, and how large uh, those investments are. Yes. So obviously, in uh, public markets, it's. Uh, quite often difficult to separate the investor impact from the company impact. And sure. I think that's the biggest question because yeah. we can only influence company indirectly via voting, um, via active engagement, etc. cetera. Mm. So uh, if you look at the asset managers, actually, how can you green your investment? You know, you can just not invest in carbon intensive sectors. So you will invest in uh, services, uh, and your CO2 of your portfolio, uh, CO2 emissions will uh, magically be reduced. However, will it solve any problems for uh, attaining right. uh, SDGs or... Um, Question mark. Yes, exactly. Uh, so what we are doing, we are... Uh, so I'm, I'm um, co-lead of a positive change strategy. And what we are doing, we are trying to engage with our companies uh, in which we invest to accelerate transition to sustainable future. So we cannot stop investing in um, 
miners because we will need metals to produce electric vehicles we you know still need metal we still need steel to produce um how to, to build houses etc so what we try to do we engage with our companies to um encourage them uh to transition faster to the sustainable future and we believe that the companies which manage to successfully um realign their products and services with uh, sdgs will enjoy better demand because you know if you create positive societal outcomes uh sure. people will need your products more and also it will generate positive financial performance so active engagement is um very important for my particular that's the name strategy. of the game you 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 will vote but before you vote you will go and talk to management if you can of yes. these companies that that you're invested in again Tell us about the size. You know how how much money is invested uh, through Picte uh, in public markets in terms of having that. Would you call that ESG integration? I mean, like, do, do, do what what term do you use to describe? Because you said even if they don't pass certain hurdles, if they are active in certain industries, we'll still invest in them. We'll try to make them better, if you will. So what what what's the name that you use? Do you use sustainable finance, ESG integration? What what uh, 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 term do you use? And how large are those investments? Yeah, so at, uh, this was regarding my strategy, but in terms of PICT, obviously in public finance, you can do it in a various, uh, by various methods, by um, ESG integration in particular. PICT, for them, uh, for us to become a leading responsible uh, European uh, financing firm is one of the targets for 2025. And for PICT group, 80% of um, uh, strategies are using ESG integration. Uh, so this is not um, always a result in active engagement, but it's more of a risk mitigation. In peak asset management, 60% of assets under management, which is more than 100 billion, um, are in uh, responsible investment solutions and 22.4 billion are directed towards environmental impact. So, mm. Pikte from so that's so you, of course, because you work in public equity, but Pikte yeah. also does private equity. And so you've given us an overview of both public equity there. It's 80 percent, 80 percent of what, by the way, or how much money are we talking about there? Uh, so this is for Pick Tech Group as a whole, yes, so, which is uh, 600 billion plus. So uh, that's probably 480 billion, if uh, my math skills. Uh, let's see, is that is that is that correct? 480 billion, 80 percent of, of of 600 um, uh, has some sort of an ESG integration. But there are various degrees, obviously. So but there are various could, degrees because some yes. because some of them, of course, you will just say. You know, you can be from any sector, you can have any kind of activity, and the filter that we're doing here, the ESG integration, exists in are you planning to change, right? Like that's what you were talking about earlier, right? So various degrees. Some others you say, we really want you to have a positive impact. Okay, so uh, so these are large sums of money uh, that we're talking about. In fact, uh, 480 billion public equity, 100 billion Private equity in a no 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 it's four hundred eighty is it's overall big it's it's including private wealth private equity and uh, okay so uh, we're we're basically um, using a, a sort of a, a filter to go from the four hundred eighty billion and then a smaller share of that is a hundred billion is it's, for it's example, in public equities yes okay and then the twenty two billion it's environmental impact strategies so strategies who specifically target improving environmental impact. Okay, I understand. So listen, we, we, we're talking about, you know, significant amount of money, first of all. And secondly, a significant share of what your company does and, and what, uh, what EDR does. So let me now turn to Andrea. Andrea, if you add up, you've heard now two examples of two uh, companies. Uh, uh, if you add up all of the sustainable finance pro products in the final sector, to what extent would you say does this add up to what is needed as outlined by Fiona? Oh, that's a big question, Peter. I think Fiona, I know, will, I know. Fiona will probably have a comment on that. Um, where I can contribute to um, the points that have been made before is in terms of um, the, what we can see from evaluating the finance system, um, the, 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 the commitments uh, and the processes and, and, and the disclosures on on what is being um, on, on what is being committed 
to fund the SDGs. I want to take a step back actually from your question, Peter, because that's a really tough one. Um, we look at the top 400 financial institutions and uh, they represent over a uh, 100 trillion US dollars. It's a crude number, but it gives you an idea of the agency that we've got. Um, I find it really interesting listening to the other speakers talking about um, where they see money going, because we can see that it is still, unfortunately, woefully low. Um, as a starting point of those that we assessed, less than 20% of those 400 institutions rec even recognised the impact that they have on the people and planet. So until you get past that point, how do you get to the point of solutions? So I think there's a lot of positive intent, um, but we as yet can't see that happening across that 100 trillion. And to try and dig into that in a little bit more detail, um, we do break it down into different subsectors of finance because we recognize different actors have different roles to play. Um, I think private equity do some phenomenal work and they are on the frontier of, for example, a lot of the climate solutions, but they are the least transparent. And I think they are the lowest score in terms of climate solutions in our benchmark. So we know that they've got the ability um, to move in those areas, but it is still far short of what's needed. And I think we, you know, I'm a big champion of the finance system. And I know there's some amazingly smart people in there, but that we need to have the reality check that it's nowhere near on the scale that it needs to be. Um, and I just, Peter, if you don't mind, I'm interested in Fiona's definition on, on sustainable finance you just discussed beforehand. I think she touched on a really important point um, is that finance needs to reconnect back to the real economy. Um, and, and I will argue mm. that you know, sustainable finance uh, underpins a sustainable economy and that sustainable economy needs to be connected to the real economy that supports a thriving society and a thriving planet. And when we start looking through that system level lens and rethinking the role that finance has to play within that, then we start moving the dial on these big numbers. Right. And so that, of course, brings us to the big question uh, of the day, which is, in fact, is sustainable finance as defined today and, and, and brought into the market today the right tool to achieve a more sustainable economic system globally? Now, I, I want to turn first back to Evgenia and, and Francois Xavier for this, because, of course, you are applying these sustainable finance principles into your product. You're selling them with conviction, I'm sure, um, while being also aware of the points of view of people such as uh, Andrea. So let me get back to you now, uh, Francois Xavier. Is sustainable finance, as, as, as you use it, do you feel like that is the right lever to uh, achieve uh, the change that we need to see in this world when it comes to sustainability? Yeah, I'm convinced about that, of course. Uh, no, maybe uh, also maybe to, to, to react on the, on the point from Andrea regarding uh, transparency. Of course, this is a, a key point, and we need to be transparent toward all uh, investors uh, because uh, we need to fight against what we call uh, greenwashing. And uh, and actually, I think private equity again is very well positioned uh, to you know to. Uh, to, uh, to um, uh, communicate, to measure uh, the impacts we're going to generate. And I, I, I will give you maybe a concrete example about, about, about that. Um, one of the key challenges uh, we want to tackle is the uh, energy transition uh, we need to operate uh, here in, uh, in Europe. We need to decarbonize uh, the economy. It's a challenge uh, because of the war in Ukraine. It's a challenge because of inflation. It's a challenge because of rising energy prices. Uh, but we need to accelerate on, uh, on that. And what we decided to do, at least, is a project we started to, uh, to, to, uh, to think about 15 years ago, but we needed time you know, to, uh, to find the, the appropriate business model to develop it, uh, is really now to develop, build, operate, and finance environmental infrastructure projects uh, within industrial sites, uh, providing solutions to them to, uh, to actually uh, uh, accelerate their energy transition. And by doing that, we provide a secure uh, green energy alternative that answers both the competitive and environmental challenge of European industry. So what does it mean concretely? 
uh, we, we produce local green energy, uh, mainly from biomass cogeneration, where we use actually industrial waste, mainly wood waste, uh, to, to generate uh, electricity and heat. And we sell the electricity to the national utility and we sell the heat uh, to the industrial uh, within the, uh, the industrial site. And so by doing that, today we have 11 projects uh, in Europe uh, in operation or under construction. Um, for instance, we have developed uh, the largest uh, uh, biomass project in Wismar, which is mm. uh, the largest wood industry cluster in Europe. And by doing that, we use more than 100,000 of biomass, so industrial waste uh, per year. Uh, we save more than 100,000 tons of CO2 and we provide electricity for more than 40,000 households. So right. you can see really you know, the impacts we, we generate. And, and to come back on, on my previous point before, uh, 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 the incentive of the team on that is based on the impact we're gonna generate. So we really want to combine right. financial performance with impact, which I think is a key point in this, uh, in this intentionality approach. Right. I think that's a great example. And so maybe let me quickly turn back to Andrea now. So Andrea, you, you hear here an example of a company that says, hey, this is what we're doing. This is the real economy impact that it has. So is it then that you're talking not about these kinds of examples, that you're saying that this is a great example, there's not enough of them? You know, what, what is the problem when you hear great examples like these? It is a great example, and I congratulate Francois Xavier on that. We we need a lot more, um, but just to put that into perspective on, on a bigger scale, and you know, I, I'm trying to give real examples. Um, I was at an event last week and you know, discovered that FDI last year fell 24 percent. Now, obviously, you know that that's a, a specific globally, section of uh, finance, but FDI, globally, foreign direct investments well, globally fell 24 percent. Right. Now, a significant part of that is China, um, which for, for multiple reasons, but you've also got India, Brazil, Indonesia, and Africa doesn't even hit on the scale. Um, and when we look at, so we also look, we look at climate solutions in our assessment of financial institutions, which is very low. We look at nature positive solutions, which you know, we're almost at ground zero. And we also look at um, inclusive finance. So we look at um, emerging markets, um, solution, inclusive finance for emerging markets, for excluded groups, and for SMEs as well. And it, we, the disclosure is less than five percent. So what Francois is is talking about is uh, is you know, I congratulate him. But if we're going to get to scale, we need to be thinking in a whole new way in terms of how our investment processes work. And I would argue. Um, we need lots more innovation in our investment structures. Mm. Finance is the master of innovation. And I agree again with Fiona that you know, finance says we can't do this alone. And it is going to take collaboration. There's some great work within the, um, the development finance institutions. And I would argue that the impact, um, the impact investing fraternity have got some great innovation going on on the product basis, which we need to bring into mainstream finance and to scale it. Right. Um, so how do we change that mindset and that that you know the market push that the invisible hand of the market you know needs to innovate. Now, a clear message uh, from you, Andrea. You know we need more innovation and we need a bigger scale. Uh, so let me turn to Evgenia now. Evgenia, you know, your company is managing a lot of money for a lot of people. Um, and you've already said that actually, you know, 80% uh, of that money is using an ESG, sort of some sort of an ESG filter. Um, but what we're hearing is from Andrea, for example, is that's not enough. Uh, you know, you need to do other things. You need to be more innovative than just using an ESG uh, uh, filter or, or ESG integration. Do you agree with that? And to what extent are you doing that? Yes, I completely agree with that. I think that um, the big question is um, to which degree we can use financial services to meet public purposes. And um, obviously, there is a in majority of the financial uh, products that I been introduced in the system now. They have um, at least dual purposes to generate. Uh, positive financial return and generate positive societal and fin um, environmental outcomes. So uh, the 
side of generating positive financial return is often still um, a primary uh, side for the fa public financial product. The good thing with uh, uh, public product, I think that exactly the scale, we can reach a lot of companies. Um, I think that, uh, for example, if you look at the um, uh, microfinance, uh, which is a brilliant concept, however, when it's not done properly, um, uh, you can see, for example, in Jordan, uh, where you still women are still, so people are still punished uh, uh, by jail term if they owe money. Uh, there were 23,000 women in 2019 who owned less than 1,400 uh, dollars each. So this is, I think, the example of microfinance gone gone bad when you completely outsource public function to a private companies, uh, which are often driven by the profit, it leads to predatory lending. So I think that to have a successful collaboration, what is important is to have collaboration between uh, state and the private companies. Uh, in case of microfinance, for example, the consumer protection is very important, the um, financial literacy, education. So you can borrow my, you can give people money, but if they don't know how to use them, whether it will actually make their life better or not right. is a big question. So this is also very important. Uh, I, so in, I think most yeah. people would agree with your assessment when you you know you, you you give a concrete example and say you know this is the problem, this is the solution that we need. Now, what I heard Andrea said earlier was that you know one of the problems is also that you know the places where the money is, which is places like Switzerland, you know London, New York. Um, with institutions like yours, that money is not being invested to the scale that's necessary in the places that you were now just talking about. So that brings it back to you and saying, yeah. like, don't you have a role now to go into those markets um, and, and and motivate your customers to place their money there rather than elsewhere? Yeah, and that's exactly what we are doing. Again, we because we're investing in public vehicles, we need to be able to find the vehicle to invest. But for example, we invested at Bank Rakyat, which is one of the largest micro lenders in the world. It's an Indonesian bank. In Indonesia, 54% of population still don't have access to formal banking. And if you look at them, they, they borrow money to, for example, several million of women. The average loan size is $130, $140 a year. And the sort of um, it's three and a half dollars per week, uh, what they return. What is very important for us and where we work with the bank, etc., is the regulation, because it needs to be um, not predatory. So it needs to be additive to the economy. But obviously we are uh, very keen to invest in these kind of public entities, but they also need to exist in the geographies where we go. In Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, it's quite difficult to find public companies which do that. I think it's much easier to find it in private sector, what Francois Xavier does, uh, but we are actively looking for it. Right. So basically you're saying the willingness is there on our side. Uh, it's just that we can't do it alone. We need help from, for example, the public sector to make sure that the um, uh, regulation is in place and that the, the frameworks are correct. So let me then turn to Fiona, Fiona, because I think that's what a large to a large degree is what the World Bank does. They bring together the public sector and the private sector to jointly invest uh, into uh, projects and they give the assurances that actually these projects work for everybody involved. So do, do you agree that then the responsibility lies with institutions like the World Bank or indeed national governments to sort of make sure that they can receive in a properly fashion this private money that is available? Yeah, it's a partnership between all of us and we, we all need to do better. We all need to put the, the pieces of the jigsaw together better. Um, and that's what we're doing. We have an evolution roadmap to how we can use our balance sheet better to do that, to try and leverage more of these finances of, of the, the leaders that you see on the panel. So it comes down to several things. One, I think, is policy. As I say, we can't do this alone in the financial sector. Don't forget there's still something like a trillion dollars of fossil fuel subsidies out there, half a trillion dollars of agriculture subsidies, which are not leading to sustainable practices. So we are all, we're, all, we're swimming against a headwind. So there's a lot of work to be done on the policy framework to support sustainable development. Two, the enabling environment. So we need to find more of the, the, the great projects that Francois Xavier is mentioning. They exist in the emerging markets, but the legal frameworks aren't there. The policy, you know, the, 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 the capacity is not there. So an awful lot of bottom up 
unsexy project development, pipeline development is incredibly important. That, that, and that's the work that we and lots of our development partners do. Um, three, then we can, what we call this trendy blending of finance, how we use a lower cost concessional finance with the market rates of finance, how we put those together to make the projects affordable. Um, we're working with the National Development Bank in Rwanda, for example. They've, they've not issued a bond before. They're coming to the market to get investment from a broader set of um, investors. We're using some of our capital to put that up to de-risk the bond, to make it less risky as it's, it's a new investor. And they can then invest in the development projects in Rwanda. So lots of those sort of creative partnerships, we need to do more on that front. But I do think we also need regulation in the financial sector. I think it's it's coming. You guys are the leaders. The laggards are not there yet. We've had a voluntary. Regulation tends to start voluntary and then move up towards more mandatory. I think that sort of gradual move is coming. It's important not to do it too quickly. We work with the regulators in emerging markets. We need to make sure there's not unintended barriers and hurdles put in place that they can't meet international standards. We need to get there gradually. But I think regulation and support from the financial sector regulators is also required. Mm. And so then, you know, I guess we, you know, we've 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 gone into a circle because Andrea, now I I come back to you and I see, you know, you have here private sector institutions that say we're ready, we've got the money, uh, we are ready to invest in the projects, uh, uh, you know, we're willing to do so. But you know, we don't have uh, the right support from the public sector in making sure that the enabling environment uh, is there. And Fiona's saying. You know, a variation of the same. Uh, you know, you need regulation. You need uh, a blended finance. You need the governments there to step in. So, Andrea, do you agree? Is that you know, is that is that the right order of things? I mean, like, it, it, does it then start and end with with governments sort of taking their responsibility, and then the rest will flow, flow from there? I think governments and regulation have an important part to play in this, absolutely. But what's essential is the finance sector doesn't sit and wait for that to happen. And I do still think there's a lot that can be done in the meantime. Um, finance is, When finance sees an opportunity, it moves on it. And a lot that's talked about in ESG, and I'll be honest, I prefer to talk about sustainable finance as a whole rather than specifically on ESG. But you know, there's the risk mitigation side of this. But the other side of the coin is the opportunity. We have the biggest intergenerational movement of money that the world has ever seen. Um, we also have a, um, a fundamental shift in values happening in society. And I argue that the finance system needs to reflect the values of society. And those institutions that innovate and recognize that will be on the front foot. Um, and some examples, I recognize that, again, we and why within the benchmarking and what we do, we are trying to look at the nuance within the different subsectors where public finance, can, where public equities can move versus private. There are different roles to play, but there is some incredible innovation that's happening in certain sections where we can see it when they're transparent that doesn't need to wait for the work of the World Bank. There's some great work on gender bonds that are going right. on. There's some brilliant collaboration going on with um, cattle beef processing supply chains and the Amazon. Um, I can see through some of the leading asset management um, institutions, again, public listed their packaging um, strategies around um, inclusive finance for women in particular sectors. So, and I think this is, you know, I like to use the analogy like we didn't realize we want, needed a smartphone. There was no demand in the market for a smartphone until they were invented. Now we can't live without them. Right. And the financial institutions are masters of innovation and can move forward in certain sections of finance to create more scale while the World Bank, um, um, the multilaterals and the development mm. institutions are working out some of those de-risking mechanisms. Right. So they shouldn't wait for the for for that to happen, and should show that they are indeed the masters of innovation. Now, you also mentioned, you know, another rationale could be that you know they think of their self-interest, they think of the opportunity side of things, and that brings me to the final question of this debate, and really the question that, that this debate was supposed to center around, which is: Does sustainable finance also lead to a more resilient financial system? In other words, is it also beneficial for the financial system itself to be directing more of its resources towards sustainable finance because it will prevent uh, you know, uh, major shocks in uh, its system afterwards? 
Evgeny and, and Francois Xavier, I mean, do you see any evidence of that being a good argument? I mean, you know, Francois Xavier, let me let me turn to you first. Like, when you do your 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 private equity investments, um, do you feel like when you do them in sustainable finance project that they, you know, are more you know sort of resilient, that they are more secure, that they uh, you know, do you see those kinds of benefits, or is that just not part of the equation? Yeah, sure. No, I think we we need to look at the, at, at the context actually. You know, so now with with inflation, with higher interest rates, it is the end of uh, the free money era, and uh, I think this is a very good news actually. You know, because uh, having free money, it was it was a bad bad signal because you can finance any type of project with, with a lot of debt and, and and you go crazy valuations and you do crazy things so i think actually this is a very good news and and uh, and, and finance should come back actually to what should be its role so supporting the industry and long-term growth in the economy and, and we can see today on the market uh, concretely uh, large transactions highly leveraged it's impossible to finance them now uh, tech startups uh, without uh, a very clear business model they can't raise anymore. Uh, and you know, as Andrea said, uh, finance is about you know risk return. Uh, it's very opportunistic, uh, and, and I think that returns should be quantified from both a financial perspective, but together with an impact perspective. And the same for returns actually. And, uh, and that's where I think, uh, you know, sustainability finance is a good answer to do that. So financing the real economy, financing small to mid-sized companies, financing new projects, greenfield projects, infrastructure projects, investing in Africa. You mentioned Africa. It's true that there is too less money uh, in Africa. Uh, but maybe just to, to finish on that point, we, we initiated more than 10 years ago uh, an initiative which is uh, Amethyst. Uh, with Amethyst, we manage more than 1 billion today in, in, in Africa. We work together with the development finance institutions and private investors. We have a ratio of 1 to 4 or 5 between development finance institutions and the private sector. And we do invest in the real economy in Africa. And to, maybe just to share with you a concrete example of uh, an investment we made. Uh, uh, we invested in Morocco. You know that Morocco uh, suffers a lot uh, from uh, significant water stress. Uh, Africa only uh, uh, represents 4% of greenhouse gas emissions, but this is the most impacted continent, actually. And, and in Morocco, agriculture is vital for a growing population. And so we decided to invest uh, in a company developing micro-irrigation uh, solutions. Mm. So you can see that this is a very, you know, basic, right. traditional investment that delivering impacts. Uh, we provide water, we save more than 100 million cube meter of water every year, right. equivalent of 4 million more cons uh, consumptions, and we're delivering uh, financial performance. So I think, I think it's really a great example, right? So you, you're saying, you know, yes, if you invest in the real economy, in real solutions, then actually you're going to see less of speculative money uh, going to you know companies that just have a business or not even have a business model but just an idea and so in that sense of course less speculation more real economy you're going to see a more resilient financial system that's what i hear you say now to me that says private equity investments with that sustainable finance lens in mind great uh, idea now you've gained it then that means what about public equity i mean like is that then where you see um, you know, more of that speculation about sort of those investments of, 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 of saying, you know, we're just going to see what happens on the stock market as opposed to what's happening underneath in the real economy. Is that is that then more the problem that we're facing or, or, or not? Picked as a house, we are a long term investor. But also, um, I think that in uh, public uh, domain, the companies which are coming to the public market, they normally already have proven business model and uh, ability to generate cash flow where uh, our right. companies are at much later stage of their development. But I think that when the interests of sort of public and private uh, coincide, it creates um, a very powerful combination. You know, in terms of financial inclusion, for example, the things are possible now that were not possible uh, 15 years ago because anybody who has a mobile phone essentially can have an access to mobile money and if you talk about the resilience and the power of sort of 
technology setup. For example, 40% uh, of people in emerging markets who made uh, digital payment did it for the first time during COVID. So COVID accelerated penetration of digital payments um, massively uh, in both public and private markets. And uh, this obviously uh, accelerates financial inclusion because the costs of acquisition of the customer acquisition in mobile payments is much lower. The regulation mm. is needed, but if you look, for example, there are companies like Mercado Libre, which is a uh, historically, uh, it's a um, trading plan, the sort of Amazon of LATAM, but they have all this data on their customers, which nobody else has, and they can provide access to finance. So these people will not be able to open account in the bank because of the lack of the data. But the technology platform often have have them, and they manage to do it um, in a risk aware manner that they make it profitable, but also they. Um, accelerate financial inclusion a lot. So I think that um, banks um, and financial sector in general is a great sector which collects a lot of information on their customers, but it's often not used. And I think now we are in this era where um, actually financial inclusion accelerates a lot and you can do it at scale by investments in public companies. Right. I mean, is it just that we're talking to the wrong companies in a sense? Well, I should say the right companies, but the wrong examples, let's say, because, Andrea, you know, like you keep on saying, you know, like we don't see uh, the financial sector playing the role that it should, you know, innovating, being the masters of finance, but making also this green transition happen, making this inclusive economy happen. On the other hand, I hear Evgenia and Francois Xavier, yeah, every time we confront them with this come back with these great examples of like, hey, no, we're actually doing what we're supposed to do. We have patient capital, we make smart investments, uh, and so on and so forth. Andrea, you're muted, sorry. There we go. Uh, I, all these examples are great, and they're all at the micro level. And again, I congratulate them both on, on the work that they're doing and, and building that into their work. But if we're talking about resilience, we need to be talking at a system level. Uh, and so, you know, how does the work that you're doing day to day at company analysis, how do you look at that? Um, and where does that contribute you know, into the bigger picture and, and some of the cultural issues, I think, that within finance? And, you know, you just you look at what happened with GFC. I, I must I can't be the only person that was angry with with what happened. GFC, with, yeah, I'm just uh, uh, quickly. Yeah. Uh... So just so I think. Could so you just, just say the, the the acronym that you're using is GFC? Could you just uh, sorry the global it? financial crisis and the financial engineering that took place there um, that you know that, that caused right. that 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 systemic risk and you know you, you, we're still in that. I know obviously the banking system is much more robust, but we're still seeing um, through you know poor culture at the top. So one of the points that we can see very strongly in our data is where you've got. Um, sustainability at the board level, at the highest level in financial institutions that sets the culture top down, that resources mm. innovation. And it isn't just a reporting or an ESG function. That is where we're going to start rewiring within the finance system. Right. So I do think that the answer to that question that is, yes, we, we're, we're, talking, we're talking with responsible financial institutions here, at least it seems so from the examples that we're hearing. Um, uh, but there's a more systemic question, which is if you add up all of these institutions, many of them, in fact, are not contributing to a more resilient uh, system. I promised I would turn to some questions from the audience. Let me do that now. Let's see, Fiona, if you can answer this first question. It's a question from Andre Hackert, um, who is basically asking on the point, I suppose, of resilience. Um, you know, are ESG investments, are they actually considered... You know, by I suppose you know the Basel, Basel framework he mentions, but 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 you can mention probably other regulators. Are they considered less risky types of investments merely because they are uh, using the ESG integration or, or ESG screen? Do you, do you have a point of view on that, or, or do you know the answer to that question? So, if you look at the, we have got a long, a long history from the longest history is from the G, from the governance, and there is a good um, examples that better corporate governance leads to better outcomes for companies. We're also seeing a bit on the e, on the on the E. So, for example, I know in China they've looked at the green um, green bonds in China, and there's a on green loans, which is a, there's a big market now in China, and there's a slightly lower non-performing loan rate for green versus ordinary bonds. So, it, it's I wouldn't oversell it, but yes, there is some evidence coming through that better ESG leads to better financial outcomes as well. Um, but also, so that, um, that's 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 sort of. 
you know, because you talk about specific things, right? You talk about like if you have better governance, then yes, you know, it's it, you're a better company, you're a more safe investment, I suppose. You know, if you are investment in uh, investing in in, in green uh, infrastructure or green the energy transition, then that is going to be a more resilient uh, investment or a more secure investment over the long term. Of course, when people talk about ESG as such, the moniker ESG. They also talk about just, you know, when you do that ESG integration, when you simply just say, you know, here's a list of criteria uh, set by MS MSCI or other, uh, uh, you know, sort of market uh, participants, you know, you say yes or no, you fit uh, with the ESG uh, screening that we're doing here. And the question then is, is that it just that, you know, Evgeny, let me ask you the question. You work with public equity. When you do that, those kinds of stocks that have gone through this ESG integration or this ESG screening, are they in them of themselves less risky or not? Do you see that bear out in their, I suppose, yeah. their share price or the you know the actual performance of these companies? Yes, we um, sort of we believe and we looked at uh, obviously there is a lot of you know people take look at the ESG integration uh, from various angles and there is as much research showing that they are. Uh, less risky than research which shows that it's not the case. I think that definitely um, taking into account externalities is very important because uh, you will not at least incur unintended bets and unintended risks. Um, you need to be very much aware of um, what you are investing in. But in terms of the share price performance, sort of fundamentals still matter a lot so it depends on at what price you bought the asset etc but uh i believe that on a longer term horizon it is extremely important to um look not only at the risks but also at the potential to create positive societal environment environmental outcomes as a potential driver for the demand and i believe that these companies will have longevity of their product, et cetera, and will um, eventually outperform. Right, eventually, but you don't, but you see that bear out today or not? Um, yes, but as I said, it also depends on the fundamentals and uh, on at, sure. at what price you're buying. So, you know, we had uh, for a couple of years, we had uh, a bit of an ASG bubble in, pri in public space where uh, all the funds uh, were running after the same companies. Yeah. And, that and so you see an inflation of their price yeah. and of course it had to come down at some point that's no longer the case though i think it it did come down a lot and i think that it also shows that you need to i believe that often you need to go beyond the sg integration uh, and uh, do more research and see what actually if, if um, sustainability is a real driver of um revenues and uh, for this company or not uh and mm. then um, you will have more robust investment cases. right so you'll see that on a case by case finally i want to come back to you um sorry if, uh, andrea quickly yes and then i'll I go just to piano for some final thoughts I just wanted to chip in on that. And I think obviously there's a timeline to evaluating risk uh, and we have to move from short termism to a longer term. And I think ultimately the direction of travel with regulation and what's coming through is that these sustainability metrics will get embedded in the financial accounts. So and when we talk about innovation and, and it can't be business as usual, when we get these factors, these costs to society and planet embedded in the financial accounting system, um, that will also also be a game changer as well. That's, that's a very good point. And of course, we have seen people mention it before. We have seen now initiatives uh, come to fruition. Last week, there was Emmanuel Faber, the International Sustainability st Standards um, that, that, that indeed have been announced. Um, and it seems like they're going to be included as of 2025. You see in EU regulation, the same thing happening as of 2026, I believe, uh, and so on. And that may indeed be a big change. It turns out to be a regulatory change. Last question for you, Fiona, um, and I'm going to integrate that with a question from the audience, from Catherine uh, uh, Foster. You know, she was quite interested by the examples that you gave uh, in terms of like how to drive investment. Uh, you know, you talked about, you know, green uh, projects, you talked about uh, uh, green bond infrastructures. You know, if, if really the, the question that we're looking at here is to drive investments at a large scale, systemic scale towards you know, these uh, uh, a project that, that achieves sustainable development goals and a green transition, then, you know, are there other examples? Are you working on those? I mean, are you uh, 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 making sure that, you know, whatever the gap is, 2.5 trillion, uh, are you working on making sure that those projects are available 
for people like Francois Xavier uh, and Evgenia uh, to to invest in? I mean, is that in the works? Absolutely. That's that's our DNA. That's what we do every day. But I think one key point is partnership. So again, helping people invest alongside the experts like a IFC, a private sector sister organization. They have a platform where the big insurance companies, including some of the Swiss, I believe, can come in and invest in infrastructure in emerging markets alongside the IFC. This is their DNA. They do it every day. The others may not know this infrastructure, this asset class. They don't know the countries. They come and they work with the people who do. We've developed, a, we've worked with a group of pension funds in Kenya to set up a co-investment platform for the pension funds in Kenya. They're talking to the big pension funds in the US. They know Kenya. They know the infrastructure asset class. We help them come together and learn from each other. So I think these sort of partnerships and platforms are how we're going to get to the systemic scale level that Andrea is talking about and move beyond fantastic individual project by project examples, really to start to pool platform partnerships and scale. Mm. Yeah, I guess in the end, it all comes down to partnerships on the one hand and on the other hand, the right uh, incentives and regulations uh, from the government. And then I suppose, Andrea, the finance sector will work its magic and show that it is the master of innovation. I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there. I know there's a lot of unanswered questions still from today. I also know that some people said, you know, we would have loved to hear people speak more and longer about this. Uh, we'll keep that in mind for next time. Remember, there are two days or I think even a whole week, right, Nora, of building bridges uh, coming up ahead. I'm sure that many of you will be going there and that we will have the chance to go deeper into these topics that we just discussed today. For now, I want to thank everyone for dialing in and I want to thank all of our panelists for amazing contributions. That's it from us. Thank you.